Hi guys, I'm Whitney and welcome back to my channel. Today's video is one that I'm really excited to bring you. Full disclosure, I consider myself a sci-fi nerd. And like so many sci-fi nerds, I didn't start out with sci-fi classics because they were long and boring, boring and required a lot of maturity to get through and philosophy and science and stuff. Give me the action. I wanted the aliens. I wanted the epic space battles. I wanted and started with most of the common stuff like Star Wars, Star Trek, Stargate Atlantis. You know, what are the star things? I decided to go ahead and read some sci-fi classics. Doing some research, I actually find out that we have two big problems. The first is what the heck is classic? sci-fi. Um, fun times guys, there is no real definition. In order to do this kind of project, I needed to have a definition. So I made one up totally arbitrarily. I decided that anything from the 1980s and before is considered classic sci-fi. So the 1990s and on, the internet is very common and so science fiction really changed. The next big problem is that the amount of science fiction that is published that's considered classic is absolutely overwhelming. I needed a actual completable goal to get this done. So I came up with this project, my classic sci-fi sampler platter. I decided to divide classic science fiction up into categories to where I could sample something from each category and make it achievable. What are those four categories that I came up with? So the first category is fiction that I'm going to read based off of the author. I wanted to read one work from the big name classic sci-fi authors. And so I divided it up by sex, the male fathers of science fiction, and then I also broke it into the mothers of science fiction, science fiction novels that were created before the 1800s. And then the last category is sort of a hodgepodge. It is the not the author that is specific or even the time period. It's actually that specific work. You know, the one that everybody talks about, that everybody says this was such a big, epic, life-changing science fiction novel. That is a title-specific novel. Let's get into them. I decided to go ahead and make the very first category, The Five Fathers of Science Fiction. There's no better place to start with when we're talking about the fathers of science fiction than with Asimov himself, the true father of science fiction. So this man was truly a prolific author. He wrote over 150 books. He was pretty much the man. This guy invented the three laws of robotics that everybody talks about today and has made such an impact in the computer and AI world. He is most well known for his ideas rather than his plots or his characters or his action. As a matter of fact, he's very widely criticized for being somewhat of a poor author, having very flat characters, having very little female representation. I wasn't really sure what to think when I walked into this, so I decided I didn't want to do one of his more famous works. Of course, I didn't do a whole lot of research in advance, but I ended up picking up the book The Foundation. I have to say I was really surprised by how accessible Isaac Asimov is and his very straightforward approach to writing. He really uses the characters to sort of deliver you an idea rather than to introduce you any ideas or emotions. It is very much a whole bunch of people sitting down at a table discussing what happened, which I didn't think would be very effective, but I was really surprised. The foundation follows the scientist Harry Seldon, who invented this math formula that predicts human behavior over vast groups. We're talking like sociology here. So in the very first chapter, his calculations are revealing that the current galactic empire will fall, which as you can imagine, pisses off the emperor, gets him and his followers banished to the edges of the known universe, where they set up a colony called the Foundation. Now this novel spans 2,000 years, so obviously Harry Seldon isn't really the main protagonist. Each chapter follows one key person as the decisions that they make or don't make impact the fate of the Foundation over the 2,000 years. This is one of the most awe-inspiring things about this novel. He was only 20 years old when he wrote it. This was such a huge, grand, sweeping epic and such a cool idea for somebody, and this 
was one of his uber original ideas. Overall, I had a really good time with Isaac Asimov, and I'm really happy to say that I think I will continue to read his stuff. I've bought at least six or seven of his books already, just trying to pull out some of his standalone fiction so I don't have to get into some of these big epic series. But all of his books are actually really short and easy to get through. I know that the foundation has recently come into social play because Apple TV, I think, started a movie or TV series on it, I think. I haven't seen that yet. I plan to watch that after I'm finished with the series. The next father of science fiction is Robert Heinlein. Robert Heinlein is very notable for his emphasis on critical thinking and his exploration of ideas around freedom and politics. He is very, very infamous for insisting on scientific accuracy in his novels, and he is basically accredited with pioneering or inventing hard science fiction as a subgenre. His critics, however, point out that he is very heavy-handed in his opinions throughout most of his novels, especially politically, and throughout his lifetime, a lot of his works contradict each other. If that's something that's really going to bother you, Heinlein might not be the author to go with. I found a lesser known work from him that I found for free because it was available on my Audible subscription. I liked it so much that I actually went out and I bought the novella. It was absolutely everything I expected when I started this project. It was so cheesy and so over the top. He had tons of sexism and racism and this like overdone discussion about humanity and his intelligence that I loved every second of it because he grossly exaggerated this state of ignorance in humanity. I thought that this novella was very akin to Heinlein's version of Aristotle's Allegory of the Cave. If you're not familiar with Aristotle's Allegory of the Cave, you can read it for free. I think it's only like a five-page work. I'll link it in the show notes down below in case you're interested. In Orphans of the Sky, which is the book that I picked up, we follow a maddeningly naive youth named Hugh who grew up in a spaceship and goes through several experiences that really broaden his understanding of his world, the understanding that there is a universe outside of where he grew up, aka the ship. In his society, which is a really interesting thought, some kind of mutiny has happened and the understanding that the humans on the ship had that they were actually on a spaceship has disappeared somehow. Being able to actually repair and make the ship functional has become more of a metaphor and a religion rather than actually understanding it as fact. Hugh, through all of his adventures, discovered that this isn't true, and yet the most interesting part of the novel comes in when he has to try to explain this to other people. Now, I don't want to give too much away. This was such a fun novella to go through. I think it only took me about four hours on Audible, if you're into that. I was very impressed. I will definitely pick up more of Heinlein. I really enjoyed the heavy handedness here because I thought that it was the right moment and he handled it very well, very gracefully, I would say. The next author is Arthur C. Clarke. Clarke is really famous for his optimistic views of scientific advancement and space travel. And he's probably the most well known for this quote that says, any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. And I think that most of his work sort of encompasses that quote. Most folks probably also know him for the fact that there is a famous novel award called the Arthur C. Clarke Award that is named for him. And then of course for his movie, the 2001 Space Odyssey, for which he also wrote the novel after the movie came out. I watched that movie in college and absolutely hated it. <laughs> So I was really worried to pick up something that he had written. I didn't really want to set myself up for failure. I really wanted to like a lot of these authors. So I decided to pick up one of his lesser known works, at least to me. So I picked up a book called Childhood's End. Man, I was whew, impressed. Childhood End starts out kind of as an alternative history with the space race between the US and Russia. But right before either one of them can launch into space, aliens arrive. We nickname them the Overlords. I'm not going to go ahead and tell you anything else about this novel because I will spoil it. 
The thing that impresses me the most about this book is how even if you don't like some of parts of this book, and even if a couple of things don't stand up over the test of time, this book has so much controversial discussion that you want to discuss it with somebody. This is one of those books that I would recommend for book groups because there's so many topics to talk about, even if you disagree with the author. I think one of the most intriguing pieces of this novel actually is present at the beginning of the book. Where the dedication should be, there's this quote right here. I think this is so intriguing and interesting because I interpret this dedication to mean that rather than having the author say the things that he said about humanity in this book and lead you to certain conclusions, I feel like he led you to these conclusions to start a discussion rather than to actually make a statement about humanity the way that he did. I think that this book, the more that time goes by, the more this book sits with me, the more ideas I get and the more discussion I want to have about this book. I'm going to try to do a review on this book because I have so many thoughts, but I can't say I'm here because I'll spoil the book for you. Next is Philip K. Dick. The man himself, another very voracious, opinionated author, and he's very well known for a lot of his ideas, especially about the human mind. One of the things that is really interesting about this author is he freely admitted that he was on a lot of drugs when he wrote all the stuff. I think methamphetamine was his drug of choice. He's probably the most famous for a book called Do Androids Dream of Electric Sheep, which was the inspiration for Blade Runner. However, because this was his most famous work, I decided to pick up something else that he had written to kind of get a better gauge for what I thought of Philip K. Dick. And so I picked up a book called Man in the High Castle. I was so excited about reading this book. It hooks you from the very back of the book. This novel is an alternate history. I think it's in the 1960s or 1970s where the Allies lost World War II. So that means America lost. And the Axis, aka Germany and Japan, cut America in half at the Rocky Mountains. So that means the east side of things belongs to the Germans and the west side of things belong to Japan. Pan. Already, this setup has me intrigued. This could be a really awesome book. And we're following a antique store owner in California who is trying to collect some pre-war American collectibles for the Japanese who now like collecting these items because, of course, they're very rare and you can't find them anymore. We also follow a divorced couple on the German side and their search for a man in the high castle who wrote this very interesting secret book that is an alternate history to theirs. Now, I'm not going to go into any spoilers here. I'm not going to tell you a whole lot more about this book. Don't ask me how, but my biggest question for Philip K. Dick after finishing reading this book is, how did you mess this up so much? PKD, what happened? I don't understand. This setup could have been one of the most interesting books I've ever read, and yet, like, nothing really happens? Nothing. Ah, oh, there's so much potential lost here. I have so many thoughts about how this book could have been better, how he could have actually formed a lot better of a plot. Oh, I feel like this book was such an epic loss for me. I have such a hard time with how much I disliked this book and how much I kept waiting and waiting and waiting for something to happen, and yet really not a whole lot of things did. I would tell you that if you watched Bane in the High Castle, which was an Amazon original, it was not Nothing like that at all. It was nothing like it. And that was probably for the better. No, no. Moving on to the last of the five, that is Ray Bradbury. So Ray Bradbury is considered a little bit more of a speculative fiction author than a science fiction author. I consider him to be one of the fathers of science fiction. I've always thought of him that way, and maybe it's just my opinion. I'm just letting you know. Uh, Ray Bradbury is probably most famous for the book Fahrenheit 451, which, at least for folks in my generation, we were all forced to read in high school. I hated it because I was forced to read it, which I think is probably legit. So I decided to give him another chance, and I wanted to read a different work of his, you know, now that I have a little bit more of a mature brain. So I picked up the book The Martian Chronicles. This is also rather a short book, more of a series of short stories than it is an entire novella or novel. You should know that kind of going into it. 
This is about the various missions of humans sending astronauts to Mars and how the aliens on Mars deal with these people who come from Earth to kind of make first contact. And I thought this book was very clever, especially at the beginning, because aliens deal with it by ignoring it or kind of disbelieving it, because all of the aliens know that there isn't life on Earth. Everyone knows that that's just wishful thinking, which I thought was a really fun way to kind of flip our own opinions back at us. I thought that Ray Bradbury did a very clever thing here, and it was very original. Even to this day, I hadn't read anything like it. So I really enjoyed this novel through the first half. And then after that, we flipped to another, I don't know, like short story or novella or whatnot, and then go a totally different direction, and all of a sudden, it lost me. I didn't enjoy it anymore. I had to struggle through it. I almost DNF'd it. It was, I had such a good time at the beginning half. What happened, sir? What happened? I don't know. Maybe he just didn't know how to end it. I don't know. Maybe I misunderstood it. Maybe I'll have to give him another chance with a different um, book later, but that was my experience with that one. Let's move on to the women of science fiction. The first one that I have in this category is Octavia Butler. She is a black female author that has written quite a few different series as well as some standalones. One of the things that sort of makes her stand out is that she always finds a way, even though she writes almost all of her characters in these very dire situations or very um, politically complex situations, she's always very hopeful somehow. I don't know how she does it, Octavia Butler, oh my gosh. Um, I was also really impressed with her writing style because it felt like it could have been published just last year, even though it had been published many decades ago. So her writing really holds up, at least for me. I think that that's a big plus. The book that I picked up by her is called Kindred, and this is a standalone novel featuring a black woman in the 1970s who somehow gets sucked back in time to the time of the Deep South and slavery every time one particular white boy is in trouble with his life. And she later sort of discovers that things are getting more complicated because obviously nobody believes that she's traveling in time and she's a black-skinned woman, so she's treated like a slave in this time. And because because she's flipping and flopping back and forth between time periods, it kind of does a little bit of a number on your psyche as you're reading the book. I was really impressed by how Octavia Butler handled a lot of issues in slavery. As you can imagine, this can get really complex. And instead of getting very graphic, she really focused on how the character survives and the hopefulness of the situation. She even draws some pretty good comparisons when her white husband gets pulled back with her and how different the two get treated. This is a book that I would highly recommend. This is a book that I wonder why people aren't reading and being forced to read in high school, because this book has a lot of stuff to talk about. Um, I highly recommend Octavia Butler. I've actually read several books by her now because of this novel. The next woman of science fiction of this era is Ursula Le Guin. Now, Ursula Le Guin is credited essentially for creating the young adult genre, which I thought was pretty awesome. She wrote an epic series called Earthsea that is a fantasy series, got a lot of wizards and dragons and that kind of stuff in it, and she was credited with inventing that genre. Before her, they say that most novels were either aimed at adults or they were aimed at children, and there wasn't really this accepted subgenre of people who are coming of age and not quite child but not quite adult. I have read one of her Earthsea novels, but I was such a young child when I read it, I don't even remember it at all. I decided to pick up something else, one of her adult novels instead. One of the things that she's also well known for besides inventing the YA genre is exploring no-no topics, especially because we're in this era where there are just certain things that people don't talk about, like exploring gender and sexism or exploring certain areas of politics Politics. Is communism a good idea? You know what I'm saying? No, no topics. She explores a lot of those topics that people don't consider polite conversation. And that's what makes her such a rock star author. Yeah, we ran out of patience. 
chance. Well, I picked up The Dispossessed because that book was what showed up in my library. And I did some research on her beforehand because a lot of her books are considered to be in something called the Hanish Cycle. And I thought this was a series, but it turns out you can read most of these books in any order. So if you do do some research on this author, don't get put off by that. The Dispossessed takes place on two twin planets, Urus and Anaris. I'm not sure that I said those right. One of them represents sort of a socialist slash communist community, and then the other one represents uh, capitalism. Both of them are sort of the epitome of both. And the story sort of centers around this genius named Shevik, who discovers how to instantaneously communicate amongst the universe. Instead of having to wait light years to send telegrams back and forth, he essentially invents a cell phone, but for across the universe. And he feels feels it's his duty to share this with the rest of the universe. However, he finds himself between these two worlds. The capitalists want to make a whole bunch of money with it, and so of course they're happy to share it, but they want to make money. And then the communist slash socialist society really doesn't find it to be of any value. They don't put any, any interest in it. This novel is a really interesting discussion between drawing the line between exploring the positives and negatives of capitalism versus the positive and negatives of socialism slash communism. It doesn't really feel Feel like she ended up on one side or the other, although you're welcome to tell me if you disagree if you read this novel. I don't think that was too much of a spoiler, but I did think that this book was really dense and heavy, and I really felt like a lot of the discussion that she had sort of went over my head. I probably missed some really big concepts in here, so if that's the case, just know Ursula Le Guin, man, ain't no joke. She is dense. <laughs> Two other women of science fiction that should be noted here would be Margaret Atwood, who wrote The Handmaid's Tale, but I didn't get around to finishing this book before I decided to film this video, so this is going to be on my TBR, hopefully later for the year. Another woman of science fiction that I didn't get to add in the original take of this video was Anne McCaffrey, who's best known for the Dragon Riders of Pern. Choosing one novel of hers was really difficult. I went ahead and picked up The Ship Who Sang. This novel is really different because it has that pulpy sci-fi feel that I kind of expect from this area or genre. This novel takes place and follows Helva, a female human who is born imperfect. Something is wrong with her physical body, and it never really says what. She is immediately taken to have her brain downloaded and trained to become a human intelligence that runs a ship. So she's not an AI, she's a human brain that is controlling a spaceship. And she has to be paired with a human pilot who will drive and control the ship. This novel was just supposed to be a fun, pulpy adventure about what happens if humans were controlling spaceflight and had to give up their physical bodies to do so. Of course, this is all about her quest to find a pilot, which is very similar to kind of sci-fi romancy a little bit. It was a fun novel, but it just lacked a lot of the depth that I really was looking for in this project. The next category is the 1800s. I picked three novels or three specific authors from the 1800s that I thought most represented this era. The first is Mary Shelley's Frankenstein. As I'm sure everyone here knows, a lot of people consider Frankenstein to be the first science fiction novel ever written. I have to admit that I read this novel in high school. Again, it was a forced novel, but for some reason I really enjoyed it. I will probably read it again later in my life as my maturity and my perspectives change. I'm always impressed by how a woman who really struggled with maybe miscarriages and how much we are responsible for our own creations ended up being so salient and poignant of a point for making a point about AI and how much we're responsible for our creations as far as AI goes and how this argument is actually such a universal one and can apply to so many different topics. I highly recommend it. It is definitely one in which you will get a lot more cultural references. <laughs> 
Pipes. The next one that I picked was H.G. Wells. He's written so many novels that I decided, hey, I've heard about a lot of them, I've seen some of the movies, and he's probably best known for War of the Worlds. But because that is his best known work, I decided to pick up a different one, The Invisible Man. This novel takes place with a man who has already figured out how to create invisibility. He is checking into a hotel and trying to frantically find time alone to discover a cure for the invisibility that he has given himself. That is the general plot of this book. And again, this one was really, really hard for me to get through. I think I discovered that um, the writing style of the 1800s is just really not for me. And Frankenstein is sort of an exception. I didn't enjoy this author. I did not enjoy his writing style. You have a man who has created invisibility for himself. And all he does is check into a hotel and try to undo it. He doesn't do anything morally bad. He doesn't do anything morally good. He doesn't do anything at all with his invisibility. All he does is check into a hotel. Why? Why does he check into a hotel? That's all he does. That's all he does with his invisibility. I, I don't understand. This seems like such a huge waste of potential. It's such a cool idea for him to come up with invisibility and then he just doesn't do anything with it. So can't forgive him for that. I'm really upset about this particular novel also. Let's move on. The next and last novel in the 1800 section that I read for this project was Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. And of course, we all have already vaguely heard the story and yet I had never really read the book and it's a really short, almost like novella sized book. So I picked it up and I think I read it in a day. And this book, just like the rest of the 1800s, is not the same story that I had become so familiar with in English class. This story was sort of disappointing in the fact that it's so well known culturally that the twist is already sort of ruined. That's kind of too bad, I think. I definitely have decided that the 1800s is not my era. It's not the literature I like. So I will probably not be revisiting the 1800s for a long while. That being said, don't let that dissuade you from checking it out and deciding for yourself if you like the early science fiction novels that were written in the 1800s. Now this last category is the one that I told you I would explain again, and that is the title specific category. So there are just some novels that are so prevalent in society or so famous that I had to cover them. One of those is, of course, Dune. Now, I think you guys all know this is by Frank Herbert. There's been a huge cultural obsession with Dune for such a long time that the movie came out and then another movie came out and a TV miniseries came out. And I know that everybody's really excited about Dune. And I'm really shocked to say that I hadn't actually read it. I read it before this upcoming movie and of course then I went to go see the movie. In case you live under a rock, Dune is about a boy named Paul Atreides who is sent to a sand world where spice is mined and spice is like better than gold in this universe. It allows people to travel between the stars. There's a lot of political intrigue and there's a big plot against the emperor and against multiple other noble houses and he has to survive the fall of his house and other such things. In case for some reason you do live under a rock, I don't want to give any more of this plot away. Uh, I know that was sort of a poor synop plot synopsis there, but you'll have to forgive me because I know that you probably already heard it and I don't want to spend too much time on something that you've already heard about. The next big novel is Hyperion by Dan Simmons. If you haven't heard of this book, you should have because it won the Hugo Award and is probably the most lauded classic science fiction novel besides Dune. This book is clever and creative and there's something for everyone. It's very accessible. It's amazing. Hyperion is a planet and in case you didn't know, this novel takes place on a spaceship that is headed toward a planet called Hyperion. 
Everybody in this galaxy knows that there's about to be a big war on the planet or around the planet Hyperion. So everybody is sort of fleeing away from the planet because they don't want to be a part of this big war. And there are some pilgrims who are on the spaceship headed towards the planet, despite the fact that they know that there's this big war. And this book is essentially their stories and they're telling each other their stories on why they're going towards this planet during such an inauspicious time. Because it's just each individual pilgrim's story, and all these stories are so diverse and so interesting, you're gonna like and fall in love with at least one of them. They all have really interesting, really intriguing reasons for why they're going to this planet. Quick warning about this book is that this is book one of four, so don't expect to have a completely conclusive ending to this novel. It is a series that I would highly recommend you pick up. It's definitely in my top five books of all time. I highly, highly recommend Hyperion if you haven't read it already. The next title-specific work is Neuromancer by William Gibson. This book is such a critically acclaimed novel because it was the first novel that coined the term cyberspace. It sort of created that cyberpunk genre that is science fiction and Blade Runner today. Neuromancer is the only novel to completely win the Nebula, the Hugo, and the PKD award all in one year. And he's famous for his unique descriptions combining both the fantastic and the realistic. The plot follows Henry Case, a morally corrupt middleman for drug dealers who has his ability to jack into cyberspace destroyed as punishment from stealing from his last job. Despite the action-packed heists, the moral corruption, and the gruesome some creativity, this novel just failed to convince me that Henry Case had any redeemable qualities. I found myself having to drag myself through the narcissistic rants and selfish whining as he crushes everyone and everything in his quest to jack back into cyberspace. I also found Gibson's writing to suffer from overly descriptive scenes that felt like he was trying too hard to convince me that this world was real. Overall, I did not enjoy this novel. The ending was wasn't very believable, and it didn't matter in the end because he didn't learn anything anyhow. The next title-specific novel is A Canticle for Leibowitz by William Miller Jr. This, I think, was the only novel that this author ever wrote. The plot follows a Jesuit priest in the future who is trying to pledge his allegiance and become a monk after the apocalypse has already happened. You get to kind of explore this world with these Jesuit monks over a long period of time. The thing that you need to know about this novel from the beginning is that it doesn't follow one particular character. As a matter of fact, it's sort of broken into three parts and follows three different characters. After the first one, then you have the second, and then you have the third. And I did not know that about this novel when I first started it, and I was really disappointed because I had become attached to the very first character and yet I didn't really understand or care as much about the second or the third character, and I didn't really see what the linking plot was other than this group of monks that I didn't really know that I cared about in the beginning. This novel was one that was kind of a miss for me in the sense that Again, I was very disconcerted, just like the Martian Chronicles. I didn't like that they just sort of dropped the plot and the characters halfway through. If that's not something that bothers you, you should definitely check out this novel. I know a lot of people who really, really like and respect this one. It just wasn't for me. And then the last one on this list for title specifics is Speaker for the Dead by Orson Scott Card. Now, before we get into this, this is the sequel, as in book two, to the Ender's Game series. I decided not to put Ender's Game on this list because I have already read Ender's Game. And because, to be honest, Speaker for the Dead, in my opinion, is significantly better than Ender's Game. 
Now, I realize that's probably an unpopular opinion. Now, Ender's Game has a lot of positives to it, but Speaker for the Dead is a wholly different ball game. There's so much more complexity, in my opinion, to Speaker for the Dead. I like continuing Ender's story as an adult. There's a lot of discussion about AIs. There's a lot of discussion about what humanity is. If I give you the plot of Speaker for the Dead, then I'm going to ruin Ender's Game. So suffice it to say that there is sort of second alien contact. Humanity is trying not to make the same mistakes that it made with First Contact originally. And of course, this is a vast intergalactic human colony, so there's a lot of complexity to it. There's a lot of discussion about religion and what humanity really is and means. I think that this novel had one of the most interesting species or alien species out there. So if you're into aliens and trying to figure out First or Second Contact, I would highly recommend it. This is also in my top five best sci-fi books of all time. And the last title-specific book of this section is 1984 by George Orwell. This novel is almost so title-specific and so classic that I didn't include it in my first run-through of this recording. Hi! That's why I'm in different clothes. 1984 by George Orwell was something that I had to read in high school, and it was uh, forced reading for many of us. What was interesting about it is while it does require some maturity in order to be able to appreciate and understand what George Orwell was doing at the time, this novel has single-handedly impact politics, thinking, society as a whole so in-depth that I do think that you have to read this novel multiple times throughout your life as you your life changes and as your mindset changes to really get everything out of this novel that can be got. What I can tell you is that I was very impressed at how he portrayed very cleverly that not just the government takes over, but that the people allow it. They almost prefer it. What I think is very clever about 1984 is how wholeheartedly the government has taken over, but instead of it being something causing people people strife and angst and something to be fixed. Most people in the novel are happier that they don't have the responsibility. And he makes quite a lot of a statement about humanity and our laziness in this novel, as well as really changing how scary it can be if people let stand back and let organizations and governments take over. This novel is, again, so classic that it definitely has to be considered on this list. And that completes my classic sci-fi sampler platter. What did you think? I hope that this was something that was interesting and entertaining for you to check out. And if you're one of those sci-fi fans who wants to get into classic sci-fi, I hope this helps come up with some way for you to make a completable, realistic goal to give yourself permission to kind of sample classic science fiction without being overwhelmed. For those of you out there who are really upset because I didn't include a lot of different title-specific or specific authors, I'm very sorry. But again, I want to encourage you to make sure you can always let me know down in the comments below what it is that you would have liked me to include. If there's enough interest, I can always do a part two or I could go straight into modern sci-fi sampler platter. Give me a like or subscribe if you want to see more content like this. And until next time, thanks for watching.